This week, Jonathan Royson from Flow Securities with us to discuss data security posture management. Then in our second segment, we'll detail how the recent Uber attack occurred and what we can learn from it. Finally, in the enterprise security news, Fortanix raises a $90 million Series C for data security. Cyrebro raises a $40 million Series C for MSSP SOC solutions. Dig Security raises a $34 million Series A. Yes, this is a repeat from last week, but we didn't get a chance to talk about it. Internet 2.0 gets funded, but probably not what you're thinking. How to hire and build your cybersecurity team. The NSA gives some bad advice on securing software, courtroom drama, Oracle makes a really bad whoopsie, all that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Don't leave the door open. Secure your APIs with the Curity Identity Server. Curity allows you to centralize identity management policies with a solution developed by an expert team using well-established standards. Curity facilitates scalable security for apps and websites by offering a unique combination of identity and access management with API security. Protect your users, secure apps and websites, manage API access. Start your free trial today at securityweekly.com forward slash Curity. Companies big and small are using AwareGo's Human Risk Assessment to measure the human risk factor in cybersecurity. This interactive solution allows companies to measure employees' knowledge and behavior across threat vectors such as phishing, passwords, sensitive data, and more. After completing the assessment, CISOs can identify vulnerable departments and roles and improve internal policies or procedures. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash awarego to start your free trial. Customers want fast and frictionless digital experiences, yet also expect protection against breaches, privacy violations, and fraud. Drive engagement by optimizing security and convenience to attract and retain customers. Use the Ping1 cloud platform to build, test, and optimize digital experiences. The no-code orchestration engine weaves together authentication, user management, and MFA, all of which can enhance security, drive engagement, and boost revenues. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy Hobbit Day. This is episode 289 recorded on Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is the master of marketing, the mayor of mayhem, Tyler Shields. How are you, Tyler? I am doing well, doing very well. How are you doing, Adrian? I, I'm I'm doing good. I could uh, I could use some sleep. It's been a busy week, but uh, but yeah, otherwise doing pretty good. How are so you? With I do Hobbits? have a question. I do have a question about the <laughs> Hobbit, uh, Adrian. Yeah. So, have you watched any of the new show, the uh, the Lord of the Rings I have. on uh, was it Amazon Prime? I think that's it's streaming. The Rings of Power. Yes, I. That's have. the one. And what's your thoughts so far? Eh, it's okay. It's it's not bad. It's um. I I was dreading it would be awful and uh, and it's not awful. It's not amazing, but it's not awful. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm simultaneously doing that and the new season of the prequel of the of the Game of Thrones stuff and the the sharp contrast between like super fantasy versus more modernized. I have not been right. able to watch any of the the Rings one at all because I've just got sucked into the the Game of Thrones side. Oh really? Yeah, I've I've actually I'm not sure if I'm going to watch that one uh, for the same reason I never finished the boys. In that, like when violence gets to a certain point, I'm just not sure I'm in, enjoying it anymore. Like you're, you're when, I wanna nice <laughs> when I want to relax and watch something, when I want to relax and watch something, I don't know that I want to see people like graphically explode on screen. You know, yeah, <laughs> like g- gore and guts and everything everywhere. I don't know. I don't know. I was much more sensitive to it when the kids were young for some reason. Like uh, all of a sudden I was really sensitive about <laughs> violence. Like not they didn't even have to be in the room. It would just affect me different, but uh may- maybe I'm still coming out of that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, definitely don't watch the latest season of The Boys. That's for sure. 
I mean, every episode, it's almost like the to-do list for an episode is like gore. Like there's got to be some scene like somebody graphically dies in the most horrible way. Somebody who runs really fast drags somebody on the pavement. (laughs) Yes. Yep. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, Also joining us is the czar of Zero Trust, the captain of content, Katie Teitler. How are you, Katie? Hello. Happy Thursday. Are you watching any of these shows? I am not. I might just get kicked out of the security industry, but sci-fi doesn't do it for me. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I, I mean, do you do you watch a lot of stuff? Like, what what's your jam? Is there any? Not really. Any... We just finished watching Sneaky Pete on Amazon Prime, okay. and that was really really good. Okay. And uh, finished before that, rewatching Dexter. And cool. now we are in the middle of Halloween Picking Championship. Some really riveting TV series for prime time. What, what is it? Halloween what? You, uh, what do you mean? You like to cook. Um, so on food TV, they have these baking championship series. And there's oh. holiday baking championship, Halloween baking championship, and spring gotcha. baking championship. It's just all and this one is cooking. Halloween baking championship. So they yeah. have all the contestants. I think they start with twelve, and they have a theme each week, and they have ingredients they have to use. And then you know, it's like a, a it, yeah. it's a big challenge. But no, the theme, I, I enjoy that stuff. I love that stuff. I eat it up. One could say. We've gotten well some said. really good ideas for cakes um, yeah. from those shows as well, and um, we try to bet. Yeah, you know, n- not monetary. Just at the beginning of the series, who we think will make it through to the end, and see if we're yeah, right. Yeah. So it's kind of fun. Yeah, awesome. I know it's not sci-fi. There's no Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, Star Trek, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but <laughs> it's cake. So what's bad with cake? Right. Everybody loves cake. Except, except probably except for, Ma- except for maybe Tyler. Who knows? Like <laughs> Tyler doesn't like all kinds of. Normal Actually, I don't things like, like at all, like Keanu Reeves and chocolate, and yeah, anyway. and cake. Adrian, I don't like cake. Uh, you, you'd be happy to hear that uh, Tyler today is is white chocolate day, which uh, <laughs> white white chocolate, as everyone knows, answers the question: What if we took chocolate and removed most of what people like about it? Then it then it turns into something that I really love. I actually like white chocolate. <laughs> of course. Oh, my God. You're such a contrarian. <laughs> I am. Well, just because everybody else hates it. If that's not true. I enjoy white chocolate, but I'll say I hate it because otherwise Tyler will change his mind. Not true. <laughs> not true at all. Guess having fun <laughs> with the wipes there. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, yeah. there's some for those listening. There's some visual gags going on, but uh, you can celebrate Hobbit Day today by rewatching the original Lord of the Rings, which is really good. And continuing to ignore that the Hobbit trilogy trilogy exists because it was really bad. So that's that's my suggestion. And maybe check out the Rings of Power. It's it's okay. It's not terrible. It's not great. Um, well, it's great. It's just it's just not amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's not. It sucks. Don't watch it. It's perfect. Have a great time it's, with it. <laughs> the first season isn't done yet. The jury's partially still out. But it's. Uh, it's it's hey, watchable. Uh, Adrian, we have a guest here with us today. <laughs> we do. <laughs> are, you, are you trying to say I'm taking too long? I'm being a little subtle for you, brother. But we got a guest here today. Yeah. Let's let's introduce yeah. our guest. <laughs> well, before we do that, uh, we do have a quick announcement here. Uh, Security Weekly listeners save twenty percent on Infosec World 2022 passes. InfoSec World will be held September 27th through the 29th at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort in Lake Buena Vista, Florida. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW and use the code ISW22 SECWEEK20 to secure your spot now. And that is in, that's one week. That's next week. So yeah, if you haven't already made travel plans to, to go and check that out, I, I hope you're, you're maybe local. Uh, to that and you can go check that out but yeah it's been a been a great conference in the past um interested to hear how it goes this year i think this is the first in-person one in a while that they've done all right so today's interview uh 
the topic is DSPM, which is Data Security Posture Management. And we're excited to have uh, Jonathan Royson with us today to help us understand this relatively new security product category. Jonathan is the CEO and co-founder of Flow Security. This is his second startup, and he previously led investigations for an IR firm. And welcome, Jonathan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Any opinions on on Hobbits or Lord of the Rings or <laughs> White So chocolate? actually here, so so here I'm in combination because I'm on Katie's team that I'm not a big sci-fi fan, but I'm a big okay. White Chocolate fan. So I would say it's a combination of, uh, uh, I mean, the panel today. Ah, uh, interesting. <laughs> That's great. Very diplomatic. Very diplomatic. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So the reason, Jonathan, uh, we wanted to have you on is when new categories pop up like this, you know, everybody's trying, you know, struggling a little bit to to understand some of the marketing, understand why we've got this new category. Why now? Um, how it works? You know, what, what the what the advantages of it uh, are? You know, why? Why? You know, why didn't we see this five years ago? You know, there, there's all kinds of questions when a, when a new market pops up. And, and this is shaping up to be a pretty big one. Um, so I guess uh, just, you know, starting out here, um, you know, how, how, how did this get started, I guess, from your perspective? You know, I think everybody's familiar with the concept of DLP, you know, and existing data security tools that we have. What was missing and what, what drew you uh, towards this particular uh, area of security? Sure. So, yes, data security is nothing new, right? Every time, I mean, whenever there is data, there is data security as well. Um, but something that has changed uh, lately, it is uh, something that I've seen. I mean, I've been doing cybersecurity in the last 15 years or so, both as an offensive cybersecurity practitioner. And as you said, I also led incident response uh, investigation. And data security was always a challenge, but in the last few years, it, it uh, became an almost impossible task. And the reason is that the environments are changing very radically. Things used to be somewhat under control. Environments were simple. There was one place where data can be in, one or maybe a few, and that's about it. But this is, of course, not the case anymore. Environments are, have changed radically. They're much more fragmented. They change all the time. Therefore, for security teams, protecting data is a bigger challenge than ever. And this is why we see such a big rise of data security posture management category and in general, the need for protecting data now more than ever. Yeah, and, and I, I think one of the things I'm not entirely clear on is, is this category specifically in the cloud uh, or does it transcend cloud and, and extend to everywhere that, that data might be? I think that when, when you're talking about protecting data, it's different than other verticals in cybersecurity. Because if you look at SaaS security, you're protecting the SaaS. If you're looking at cloud security, you're protecting the cloud. If you're looking at endpoint security, you're looking on the endpoints. Mm -hmm. But in data security, it's not a vertical, it's more horizontal. Uh, and when companies care about where they store social security numbers, credit card numbers, they want to see it all around. Therefore, uh, the approach for data security must be much more wider and much, uh, I mean, everywhere that data flows, this is where uh, data has to be protected. It is correct that we are seeing a lot of focus in the cloud, uh, but when you're asking security teams, they will tell you that it's only part of the picture. Uh, it's a really good point, you know, in, in that way, it's it's kind of like monitoring, right? You know, and log management, you know, you, you don't just have logs in, you know, just endpoint or just cloud, you know, it's that that's something that's also everywhere, right? Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. One of those things that, you know, uh, again, a company, a healthcare related, uh, you know, a company, uh, digital healthcare, they care that their, the PHI, the health related information of their customers uh, is being kept safely. Uh, and that doesn't, they don't care where that is. You're right. And, you know, I think one of the things we really struggle with, there, there are actually some startups uh, we are going to talk about in the news segment, um, you know, protecting data. Uh, so almost everything about data is is really hard. You know, sometimes you get descriptors with data. You know, if you're lucky, there, there's an XML or a JSON that describes what the data is for you. You know, other, other times it's, uh, 
you know, it's just raw data that's not described. So almost everything about it, uh, you know, classifying it, determining what data you're looking at, protecting the data is, is, uh, is really difficult. So how do you, you know, with a data security solution, how, how do you approach that? You know, when, when you're kind of walking that line of making data difficult to use, you know, but you need to protect it, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, it does. And I think that um, organizations do not appreciate solutions that require them to change the way they operate. Uh, the characteristic that you said about data, the fact that it can be everywhere, it can be in different shapes, actually, it's a good thing. This is what made working with data so easy in the last few mm -hmm. years. Uh, so for R&D teams, it's a blessing. It is a nightmare for security teams that have to discover, classify data, and protect it. Uh, and I would say something that I, I use the term of data liquidity. Data can flow everywhere. It's, it's almost like a liquid uh, that you have to, um, yeah. to locate. Uh, and I think that uh, DSPM tools or general data security uh, platforms has to take uh, to take that under, I mean, they have to refer to that characteristic of the data whenever they want to discover and classify data well. I'd also say I, I like that data is like water metaphor, because also like water, if it leaks, it can ruin things. It can ruin everything, right? <laughs> Absolutely, can, exactly. Cause, cause all kinds of damage. <laughs> That's um, perfect. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I'm 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 gonna have to borrow that metaphor uh, going forward. Uh, Please do just just put you know a few cents in a jar every time you do, and you know yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll give you I'll, the address. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll attribute it back to you. Um, yeah. So so let's um you know so maybe last question before we we kind of jump into the details of what uh um you know, this product product category is is comprised of, um. You know, going back to more traditional ones, you know, I think it's it's just, you know, the nature of us, you know, our experience in security, you, you know, a lot of people, and, and you probably run into it in sales meetings, uh, where, where people will think of old school DLP, you know, previous data security solutions, uh, and the ways those worked, you know, how, how relevant are people's previous experiences with DLP products, you know, is this an evolution of um, some of the pre-existing concepts and, and the way those products work, or, or is this totally new um, and doesn't share very much with the, you know, the, the, the old school? I think that modern data security platforms, data security posture management platforms, uh, I mean, literally, they also do data loss prevention in one way or another. So, but so this is something that they have in common with DLP. But this is about it. There is nothing to compare between um, what you see today, the category, with DLP. Also, I think that DLP category has gained a pretty bad reputation uh, as a category that affected a lot the business continuity um, and was struggling against the users uh, of the data. While we see the new category today uh, for many different reasons as an enabler, as something that companies use in order to be able to proceed and continue to deploy, to develop as fast as possible without taking the risk of a data leakage in their environment. Right. All right, so yeah, let's let's jump into the uh, the product. You know, I think the way I've heard most um, DSPM vendors describe their product is they they go through stages of using the product. Uh, do you do the same thing with Flow? What do you mean by stages? Well, like uh, before you can protect the data, you know, or even classify the data, you have to discover it, right? So the kind of you kind of have the discover classify, and then some kind of policy enforcement, right? Oh, I see. Uh, in a way, it is correct. I mean, of course, that when you were talking about data, you cannot protect what you don't know that exists. So, of course, always the first step is discovering classification. And here there are different approaches of how that should be done. Uh, but this is always the best. Know your enemy, kind of. 
Um, and then based on that, uh, there are different use cases. One of them is, as you mentioned, is policy enforcement, just making sure that data is in the right place. Another thing is risk uh, finding, risk assessment, automatically find misconfigurations, any kind of um, situation where your data might be at risk. Another thing is egress management, making sure the data does not leave your environment to where it shouldn't be. Uh, permissions, all of those things are part of the big platform that is called data security management or data security platform. Uh, and this is what uh, every DSPM vendor is trying to do. Gotcha. And it's, it's interesting because it, you're not just looking at the data, you're looking at all the controls that, you know, allow that data to, to pass certain boundaries, it sounds like. Yes, I, I, it's not only about the data, it's also about the context and the metadata, and I will explain. One thing is finding uh, data like PII in the wrong place, in a log server or in external service where it definitely shouldn't be in. This is one thing, but as we said, like the chaotic environments that today uh, organizations have, it's not enough just to know that you have data in the wrong place or there is a misconfiguration. You also have to understand which application is it related to? Which business unit uh, is the right one? What is the full journey of the data? Where it came from? Who is the user? Who is the engineer that I have to contact to solve that potential issue? And that is something that is much more holistic than only the data, but also everything that has to do with the data uh, in that context. And and how how do you discover the data itself? Is, is do you have like a a tool that people can run? You know, maybe on a file system in an EC2 instance or something like that. Um, you know, I, I I imagine you're probably logging into databases. Um, you know, you need access to S3 buckets and and file shares and things like that. You know, does this extend to you know again with the the cloud question? You know, are you only looking in uh, places like Azure and AWS? Or are you also looking in like uh, uh, Google Drive and Dropbox and Box and places like that as well? Well, this is a great, great, great question because as I said, organizations want to, want to see data wherever it flows, not only in, mm -hmm. in one place. And I think that many of uh, what we see today, the data security posture management vendors, uh, do cloud DSPM, which is like you said, connecting to Azure, AWS, GCP, uh, finding the S3 buckets, uh, scanning them, uh, which is great, but it is somewhat partial. Uh, and this is our big differentiator. Uh, we are not looking at data only at rest. We are doing that as well. But our approach is also looking at data in motion. We are analyzing the data flows uh, from the those databases, managed databases, to the, through the applications with all the journey uh, in the applications and also externally, where they're being shared to SaaS providers, like you mentioned, external data stores, unmanaged databases, shadow databases, no one knows about their existence. All of that is being mapped. So using those two engines that we have, both analyzing data at rest, analyzing data in motion, we really cover 360 of the environment in a way that we can really find, discover, and uh, classify data wherever it flows, but also managing um, the different use cases that I that I just mentioned: risk, uh, finding policy, and managing policies, and so on. So, you know, talking about how data flows, you know, that that's something that back when I was a PCI QSA, that would come up uh, quite a bit. That was actually a requirement: is you, you had to have uh, a diagram that showed how the cardholder data flows. You know, because otherwise, how how are you supposed to audit it, or how are you supposed to protect it if you don't know how your data actually flows through your environment? And uh, and it comes up a lot in third-party risk management, uh, uh, you know, and supplier conversations as well. Like if you're going to be handling my data, you know, I want to see that you at, at least have some kind of diagram that shows uh, how it flows through your environment so that that can be audited. You know, so is, is that something that your product can help with? Uh, you know, can, can you actually, I don't know, you know, select a data type and show me the flow, show me, you know, all the places this data goes. 100%. This is our bread and butter, uh, both for compliance uh, and privacy and motivation, but also for security. Um, as we see the data flow and the data at rest, this is exactly what we do. Uh, our customers can, in two clicks, see 
as for your example, where do I have credit card numbers? Not only where they are being stored. Show me the full journey of credit card numbers in and outside of my environment. Show me wherever I have European uh, users' data. Where do I have uh, healthcare-related information? All of that mm-hmm. is can be done very easily. But also, as I said, it's only the first step. Based on that, you want to see controls right. about it. Who has access to it? There's no over-permissiveness, um, setting policies. This is this is the whole package. And, and do you see, uh, you know, that third-party management or that that vendor management piece of it as as a common use case where somebody needs to prove to a to third a third party that they're handling uh, their their data correctly, you know, that they have the right controls and things like that? Is is this something that uh, your product something that can help them prove that they're they're securing that data? Of course, I see that using our product, uh, audits are being done much more easily and much uh, Mm -hmm. quicker. But honestly, what also we see is that uh, auditors today are not, um, I would say the maturity of the auditing uh, is not high enough in order to get to the granularity of what we do. It's kind of an overkill, I would say. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. much more for not only making sure that you are PCI DSS compliant, but also making sure that those credit card numbers really are uh, safe and secure. And as you mentioned, PCI DSS, I can also hear uh, um, name an example of a uh, company where we deployed, uh, we did a POC of two weeks, we deployed on a very small part of the environment, and we found dozens of different uh, PCI DSS related assets outside yeah. of the PCI environment, including two external services to SaaS providers where data was being sent to Uh, and that was a mind blowing so it's not (laughs) i mean so even if they pass the audit um needless to say that this is a situation that they had to solve yeah as an xqsa it's not mind blowing for me yeah i think when we were talking uh to to prepare for this show i i probably mentioned that uh I think a hundred percent of the cases, uh, or the companies that that I, I worked with, I found cardholder data outside where it was supposed to be, or, or the the controlled environment. So, ab- absolutely something that that you have to do. You have you have to check for that. Let's, for that let's data. not name any names. We don't want to yeah, you know no. uh, <laughs> to scare anyone. No, I mean, I mean it's 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 good news. Like that was the job I was being hired to. Do to do for them, you know, is to make sure that that data didn't exist out there. And, you know, it did, and we cleaned it up and we moved on, you know, and lesson, lesson learned. But um, yeah, kind of moving to the next stage here uh, from, from data discovery to actually classifying the data. Traditionally, I think that's been one of the toughest jobs in data security is, is taking um, unstructured data, even structured data, and trying to figure out what it is do I care about this? Is this regulated? Uh, how hard a problem was that to solve? First of all, it is difficult. Uh, data classification is always hard, and you want to use cutting-edge technology in order to solve that. Um, but here, we tackle it from two ways. One is that cutting-edge technology today is not the technology that was 10 years ago. Uh, there are machine learning algorithms that you can use, statistical comprehension. Um, that have an amazing, amazing results. And also we have a lot of proprietary algorithms that we use. But secondly, I go back to the context side. One thing is looking at a stream of bits and trying to understand if that is a social security number or not. Uh, Another thing is understanding it in the context of the application and of the business. If you Mm -hmm. see uh, numbers that go from um, an application that you see that is relevant to billing sent to an external service that is related to financial services, or if it's something that has to do with, I don't know, HR, this is something that helps you to have not only understanding of the data itself, but also the full context of it. Therefore, uh, classifying data in this kind of environment, when you have this comprehension, uh, is something that you can do much better than out of context data classification. You know, something that strikes me as challenging is, you know, as you talk about the context, like, you know, if I see social security numbers going to like a, a streaming service or something like that, you know, I'm, I'm going to think, you know, that's probably a false positive. But at the same time, you know, if, if you ever decide to make data exfiltration a feature of your product, um, that's exactly how a lot of attackers exfiltrate data, right, is is 
uh, is leveraging that that context using a service you wouldn't expect to have sensitive data, you know, to to smuggle that data out, like DNS or um, Gmail or something like that, to to smuggle out source code, for example. Like it, I I don't think is that is that are you doing any kind of data exfiltration detection or anything like that, or is it just more about the the controls and classifying and and uh, finding all the data? So the answer is yes. And I think that here um, we went really far with the sophistication of this kind of uh, uh, data uh, breach. However, yes, this is something that we will see because let's say that there is an attacker that does it in a very sophisticated way. But from that, he, but when he does it, he does it for an application or for a, work, a workload that he got the data somewhere from, right? I mean, he gets it from the database. So when those social security numbers right. Are being, are being extracted from the database, this is where we find it. And this is where we'll see an anomaly. And before we, we see where it's being you know, uh, um, hidden, uh, when it's being exfiltrated, we will see such a big anomaly that you will understand that something is going on and you will be able to react uh, fast enough. So because you can connect those flows, you know, you, you, you know the, uh, there, there's a good term here and I, I, I'm going to blank on it. The, uh, I don't want to say paternity that the, the um, you know the the destination of the it's a much better word uh, that I'm looking for, <laughs> but you know because you know the source uh, of the data you know because you're tracking it uh, as it uh, as it uh, I'm trying not to use the name of your company so much as it flows through the environment. Please do. Right? It's, Please do. It's, it's, it's it's a very good name for the company because uh, as you describe what it does, you use that word over and over and over again. But uh, yeah, Providence. Thank you, Tyler. You ha you have a microphone. You can jump in. <laughs> I didn't know? want to interrupt you. I, I was watching your struggle. It worked for me on this side, so don't worry too much. You, you didn't want to break my flow. No, your flow is all about struggling there. So I decided to type it to you instead. <laughs> uh, either way, I appreciate it. Yeah. So because you know the Providence. Uh, you know that hey, this came from a database, and and now it's going out via Google Drive or something. You know, so that uh, um, you know, obviously that uh, um, you know that that's how you can tell. You know, maybe this is an exfiltration event, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that uh, the way that I would put it is that when you want to protect data, you cannot look only at the data. You have to understand the business context. You have to understand right. the full journey of the data. You want to understand the owner of the data and the user, the consumer of the data. Only by looking uh, widely on everything that has to do with the data, you will be able not only to classify it, but also protect it well. So, you know, what, what should customers expect? Like, how much time do you have to... You know, I, I imagine implementing the product, hooking it up to, to APIs, you know, giving it the credentials it needs. All that can be probably done fairly quickly, you know, but how, how much time, uh, you know, what, what, what's the effort necessary to then analyze all that and understand uh, the business context and apply that in there? Because there's, you know, to, to a certain extent, you know, you can't do all of that automatically, you know, at some point. I imagine an analyst has to look at all this and put it all together, right? So not necessarily. And I would say that in 2022, um, the patience that security teams have uh, is not as it used to be. Uh, if it's not instant, if the deployment doesn't take a few minutes right. and the value is not instant, no one is going to deploy it. Um, and luckily, it's not only data security, I mean, generally, in my opinion. And luckily, we're not a difference here. So the the deployment takes literally two to three minutes uh, to deploy it everywhere. Um, and the value, I mean, just to save the discovery or the visibility, the classification, and also a few risks, this is something that usually we show to our customers during the deployment uh, session. So this is something that they see instantly. Of course, there are some customizations that can be done. If you want to change the classification, you want to set policy, this is something that you can do on the way, but 80 or even 90% of the value and the classifications and the logic of the application and so on, everything happens instantly right after the deployment. So I wonder, you know, one of the things that's really important, I think, with a vendor is is to achieve what, what I like to call the, the aha moment or, the, or a light bulb moment, you know, that moment where, 
you know, sometimes it happens during the, the sales pitch, you know, something in the sales pitch just clicks and they realize, okay, yeah, this is something I need. Uh, or sometimes it happens during the, the proof of concept. Uh, what, do you do you have a good idea of well you 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 must I would think at this point uh, where that happens with your customers and your product what what is that light bulb moment uh, when customers are like ah you know that that you know I get it now this is this is why this is a thing of course so I would say something about the feeling that I I see in many security teams uh, with the change of the environments something happened they kind of lost control. Because when mm. things used, used to be simpler for them, there was deployment once a month, there was a security audit based on it. So everyone asked them, hey, you know, we want to do this and this and that changes. What do you think about it? And of course, it's not the case anymore. Now there are dozens of deployments a day. They have no idea what is going on. And they have to ask the engineers what are the changes and kind of chase them just to make sure that the data of the customers really is safe and so they can do their job. And I would say that the aha moment is the first time, and this happens in the deployment process itself, where they see their own environment for the first time in the eyes of you know, data security. They see all the applications, they see all the databases, all the external services. They see where they have uh, any kind of data that they want to, to have. And something, and you know what, I'll give you an example here. Something that happened to, um, uh, to happen to me with, it was a healthcare related, uh, like a yeah, digital healthcare company where I said, hey, you know, you're sending a PHI uh, of your customers to an external service in a very unsecure, very, uh, yeah, uh, not secured way. Uh, do you know about that? And he he asked the engineer that he was in charge, like, hey, do we do, we do it? And the engineer said, no, 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 no chance at all. And when I said, <laughs> okay, but ask him if it's not in that parameter from that application. And then it was really the case and it was solved in a matter of minutes. That, that's, a feeling that they have the control back. They, they can argue with their engineers and say, this is something that is wrong. This is the strongest aha moment. And this is something that luckily happens on almost every POC that we do. And that's what closes the deal. I can totally see that. You know, again, from my background, you know, with it being my job to, to make sure that data you know, in, in, in several jobs that I've had uh, shouldn't be certain places, whether it was pen testing or the PCI work I did. Um, yeah, that, it's a very visceral feeling, you know, especially when somebody, because I, I heard that often too. Yeah, no way that's happening. You know, we would never do that. You know, <laughs> you're like, yeah. well, here it is. Here, here's the evidence. You know, it's it's happening. Yeah, it's it's Sounds a very stupid. visceral feeling. It's 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 one of the best ways to to land with a product like that is is when when you find those those problems right a, right away. Like during the proof of concept, I imagine you find some of this before they're even a customer, right? Oh, of course. I mean, uh, I, I something that always happens that you know you show them these are all the external services that you are using. I guess that you know about that, uh, yeah. and now I'll tell you all the risks. And then they say, no, 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 just let me see. What are them? I mean, I want to do a, a screenshot uh, of it. And the yeah. nice thing is that um, when they have that control, actually it makes the work with the engineers easier than, than ever. Because if they don't have that control, they have to always stop and block the work of the engineers to make sure that everything happens the way it should be. And now using a tool like Flow where they have uh, the visibility, and the control of what is happening, they can tell them, you know what, go ahead, go ahead. I know it's uh, it's okay. They don't have to cut their flow. Sorry about that. I, I had to do it at least <laughs> once. So. No, no, you are you are well within your right to uh, to work the the name of the company into into what you're saying. Absolutely, that's great. No, th this has been great, uh, Jonathan. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, I I love customer stories too. Uh, the anecdotes. I, I think that really helps uh, kind of land like w what you're trying to do, what you've built. Uh, you know, help, helps it. Uh, you know, make make more sense to the listeners. But uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. No, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure for me as well. All right, stay tuned. When we come back, we're going to dissect the recent Uber hack. So we'll have some fun talking about that in a few minutes. <laughs> 